welcome to episode 9 of Heresy from the Haven, a Wobbly Goblin Productions podcast. We're coming to you from the Gamers Haven in lovely Spokane, Washington. We are your hosts. I'm Bob. I'm Jay. I'm Steven. And this is an uh, intro, a podcast that we're doing. I think we're, what are we up to now? It's going to be 9, 10, 11? A lot more than we thought. We started, we thought it was going to be 8. Now we're, I think yes. we're up to 11. Um, this being episode 9, what we're, we're trying to release these as a series for a person who maybe has played other Warhammer games or hasn't played any Warhammer games at all, and why they might want to choose Horus Heresy as a game to get into. Yeah. Um, in past episodes, we've covered uh, different things like army building, um, sportsmanship, um, just reasons why you want to play the game. Why, it kind of makes this game different than other Games Workshop Warhammer-based games. Uh, we finally shifted to doing Legions. So the last four episodes, we did two episodes on the Loyalist Legions and two episodes on the Heretic or Traitor Legions. And the next two episodes, this one and the next one, we're going to be focusing on non-Legion factions, factions that were present during the Horus Heresy battles. Non-Space Marine Legions. Non, well, the Legions are Space Marines, right? Or Titan Legions. I guess that's true. Semantics. That's semantics. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in this episode, we'll be discussing a bit of the story or fluff, as a lot of people like to call it, uh, background of the factions. We're not diving too deep into the rules at all. This is more of a kind of an overview of what these factions are like and uh, whether or not you'd want to start them as a main faction or uh, in our final episode, we'll talk about building army lists a little more and how, what allied factions are. Our hope is that a new player can listen to these and, and find all the tools necessary to decide if Horus Harry sees a game for them and maybe help them pick a faction that they want to play. Yeah. So... In this episode, we are going to be covering first and foremost would be the Mechanicum. Yeah, I think these episodes are really good for if you're just at your local hobby store or online looking at these armies and you have no idea what the Mechanicum is or who they are. They're the, the builders. Yeah, these episodes, we're trying to give that kind of a brief overview of kind of who they are and what they do. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind, I just always say, is Martians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> doesn't like Martians. <laughs> So in the storyline, uh, Mars is actually home to the Mechanicum. Um, if you like soulless robots, uh, big guns, uh, weird machine magic, um, the Mechanicum is for you. So in the beginning, after the Emperor kind of uh, conquered Terra or Earth originally, he set his sight on the stars. And that next step was Mars, where this, this cult of machine god worshippers were kind of hanging out and living. And they believe that knowledge is kind of the ultimate sign of divinity in the galaxy. They believe in the omniscient of the machine god. This kind of this weird cult. So the emperor actually made a deal with them, the Treaty of Mars. Um, said he was conquering them, he made a treaty where Mechanicum, whether or not they really do or not, they think that if they believe under this treaty, the emperor is the uh, kind of amalgamation, the, the omniscient in the flesh, right? Yeah, because he had banished all religions. Yes, right? he did, did not like it at all. <laughs> But in return, they uh, would provide the Astartes, the emperor, with war machines, uh, engineers, scientists, this kind of like lost knowledge that the emperor didn't have um, and had probably never seen before. And they actually got to keep a certain level of independence from the emperor, which is, if you know a lot of the... <laughs> They're the suppliers. <laughs> they don't want to piss off the suppliers. A lot of going far, uh, <laughs> forward, independence is not a thing you'll ever hear about ever again. So it's kind of a unique, unique situation. So believing that knowledge is life and everything, Mechanicum improve themselves. I will use improve um, through cybernetic enhancement, augmentation. Um, in fact, most of the uh, tech priests and large leaders in the Mechanicum are almost purely robot at this yeah, point. Yeah, more machine yeah. than flesh. Yeah. So picture, just kind of picture that in your mind. Um, they are not only prevalent on Mars, kind of the cool thing you'll hear about throughout the heresy and even going forward is uh, something called a forge world. So think of a forge world as a planet-sized production factory. Right. That's big. And, yeah. They're found all throughout the galaxy in this, this narrative universe. And it's, a, it's pretty cool stuff. Now, even during the heresy itself, um, they kind of played both sides. Harris, being diplomat, he was. He, he convinced some of the traitor legions. Sorry, Trader Mechanicum to turn 
and support him. Dark mechanics. Yeah, dark mechanics. You can definitely play them both ways. It mm -hmm. kind of plays into what we've been talking about uh, the last few episodes. So you can take them as a traitor or a loyalist. Yeah, you have no problem playing either sides with them. Um, some of the key differences between Mechanicum and Space Marines, since you kind of have, I look at it this way, and I kind of compare them to to kind of give you something to think about. I compare them to almost like a fantasy undead army, where you have these kind of majos, tech priests at the top, almost as your necromancers, and you have these these soulless, interesting, interesting, okay. soulless automata, these soulless robots that kind of build and raise. They have they have a bunch of cyborgs, but they have no souls. They take people, kind of convert them. Brainless. Again, nobody's good in this universe, right? No, it's bad universe. <laughs> it's, Nobody wants to be here. Everyone's bad. Right? <laughs> That's the good mechanic. <laughs> That's the good <laughs> mechanic. <Yeah. laughs> Throw chaos in the mix, and then we got a whole... We got then a whole they're better. That, yeah. <laughs> you go from good to better. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> chaos works. Works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the tabletop itself, um, really cool, aesthetically pleasing army. Oh, beautiful army. I mean, they're painting awesome. and modeling, and it's just, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with them. They tend to be, as you play style, a little bit shooter heavy, um, just kind of how their rules come out. But you can certainly make assault based mechanic armies. They're out there. Um, you think of big robots, fast, agile robots, there's cool stuff. <laughs> in, in fact, a mechanic of just. I uh, killed Vulcan in my last game. Yeah, yeah I charged. Yeah, yeah. I charged a Mechanicum unit in a, an event I played in last weekend. Yeah. That uh, he told me, yeah, they're not very good in close combat. And I went and did a bunch of damage to him, and then they turned around and swung back and wiped out my whole unit. My close <laughs> combat. Unit. I'm like, That's not good. No. He's like, well, I mean, it could be better. I'm like, well, I guess. Yeah, that's relative. <laughs> So they're just a very interesting army. Um, the way you can build them, they give you a lot of different styles. Basically how it works out is you kind of pick your, your HQ choice, that kind of leader we've talked about in previous episodes, and then you pick an order. There's a lot more fancier words. I'm trying to keep it simple for you. You pick an order in this cult that kind of drives how you build your army list. Um, you can do all sorts of different things from taking the bigger, uh, bigger engines, the bigger automata they're called they have, um, kind of swarm armies, a bunch of different play styles. Yeah. That sounds cool. Yeah. So instead of the right of war, they don't necessarily have a right yeah. of war like we've talked about in the legions have these right of wars that help you kind of give you bonuses and negatives on how you build your army. Um, these guys have these orders, the, yeah. an order of the Mechanicum that they take that allows them to kind of tailor how they're building exactly. their army. Gotcha. Yeah. The last cool thing I really enjoy about them is we talked about a little bit, might have been the last couple episodes, about uh, librarians or psychers. Mm -hmm. We kind of tap into that chaotic warp energy to cast spells, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. The Mechanicum actually have a similar rule set and kind of narrative fluff where they they tap into that spirit of what's called the Machine God, the Messiah I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So they have casters, quote unquote, themselves, but they're kind of geared more towards dealing with the vehicles or buildings and things like that. So kind of their own unique. They can repair, like in gameplay, yeah. they can repair things that have been damaged during the game. Yeah, very easily. They can keep their machines moving forward. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And that's in which book? Let's, let's make oh, sure. sorry. It's a Liberal Mechanicum. Talking about right here. Um, there's four different army books we have in Heresy. Yep. Loyalist, Heretic, Liber Mechanicum, and Liber Imperium. And the forces that we're talking about in these, this episode and the next episode come from either these two books or PDFs that Games Workshop's released. Which we'll, we'll, we'll cover which yeah. is which. Right? Which are official content, just not officially released as a book. Right. right. So. So again, you have 18 space from legions, and we finally have this totally unique, on their own narrative uh, fluff based army. It's a super cool, <clears throat> super fun. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Anything else about the Mechanicum? That's all I got. They're the mechanics. They make all the space marine armor, space marine tanks, guns. I, I will say, all. I didn't know much about any of the armies in these books that we're looking at right now. And just the ones I read made me interested in everything we read yeah. like we're diving into stuff that we're not sure about yeah. like we'll, we'll get ready for you guys in this podcast i read about it. i'm like i want to play that already now yeah, <laughs> like, to buy models. Yeah, yeah. super cool stuff we should so, probably jump over to what the bodyguards of the emperor yeah so um i'm gonna do i'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about the custodes uh they're in the libra imperium um the custodes are basically the the bodyguards of the emperor made from Supposedly, the flesh of the emperor himself. Allegedly, allegedly. Right. Allegedly. Firm or benign. <laughs> um, they are. They are to space marines, what the space marines are to the mortal man. Yeah. Essentially, um, 
They are renowned as the Golden Legion, so all of their armor is special, it's unique, it's all gold, and it's better than what the Space Marines get because they're the Emperor's personal bodyguard. Um, they guard the Imperial Palace and the Golden Throne. I don't know if they have that yet. But it's not throne, yeah, yeah. I didn't think so. But <laughs> <laughs> they, there's, yeah, there's a Gold Spoiler Throne. Alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they do the vast size of the Imperial Palace. They always act as a defensive army, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, and for much of the histories, they rarely left the Imperial Palace. During the whole crusade. During the whole yeah. crusade. or They barely even left Terra. Uh, even more rarely. Um, so they get to decide who enters the throne room of the emperor and who walks around in the basically private area of the emperor's palace. Uh, they are the last line of defense and the first ones that tell you, no, you don't go there. Uh, their authority is so much so that space marines, inquisitors, all kneel before them. Not Primarchs, but pretty much anything other than a Primarch of the Emperor himself, they, they kneel before the, these amazing warriors. And something else that is interesting about them is that they are where the Space Marines were kind of just implanted with this thing that turns them into Space Marines. The, the way the Custodes developed, it's more of a infancy, alchemy, ch genetic change that they go through um, from birth, almost from almost from birth, uh, in order to birth that, in order to create this this guardian. Um, so <clears throat> they were, let's see, they were originally during the Terran Unification Wars. So when the Emperor was conquering. Mankind for the first before that he set off into the stars on Terra that he was made these custodians to be his guard his personal guard during those wars So they've been around for a long time and in order to do that and to take from the most loyal possible gene stock Custodes are only created from nobility Terran nobility they are basically uh, bequeathed to the emperor and his cause as infants. Going on. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. They are kind of raised, uh, raised in, raised as as custodes. Um, let's see where they have the most advanced weaponry. They have the most advanced armor. Uh, things that he wouldn't even let the primarchs or the the space marines have. His custodes. They were originally uh, formed as a force of ten thousand, and. Unlike the Space Marine Legions, where they're just, I'm a, I'm a Space Wolf, I'm a Blood Angel, I'm a, uh, an Imperial Fist, the uh, Custodians all have specific names. They're all identified by, their rank doesn't really matter so much, it is more their specific name, and they're named after the mythology of Terra. So all of their names are unique, and Cerberus, and things like that, like from actual Greek and Mythology. Roman awesome. mythology you probably have a lot of fun with your building your army naming stuff. Like it's that. absolutely uh, could be a, a wellspring of uh, funness for that. Um, let's see here. They, unlike Space Marines, uh, the Custodes are independent fighters. They were encouraged to learn independently of, and their training was very much a a one on one basis or. Uh, specialty training like that they weren't subjected to these fighting pits or these trainings drills or anything like space marines are they are taught to independently think and independently train mm. so they can be independent so all the stuff that the emperor didn't allow anybody else to do he encouraged in them he encouraged them gotcha. they are uh they are they get they get to be their own the people a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> i can't just don't good guys um Let's see. Uh... Now, I have a quick question. Rules-wise and narrative, can you actually play a traitor? No. Stokes? You cannot. Well, yeah, I didn't think you could. It is It is not allowed. Uh, the, uh, I was going to say everything in this book, but it's not actually. Not everything in this book. Uh, custodes, are, you're not allowed to be a traitor. Uh, another th the thing that I found interesting about uh, the, the Custodes is that they don't have a battle cry at all. 
<laughs> they fight with silence and grim determination. And they're for business. They are there to kill anything who opposes the Emperor's will. And that's pretty much it. Um, which leads to their army ability, which is called uh, Nemesis Units. <laughs> Which have you been on the short stick of that? Sure yeah. have. <laughs> What's fascinating about this is that they only get one thing, and this is the thing. And That's real good. essentially, yep. I won't go into the details about it, but bonuses against elite units, like the better you are at something, the better the custodes are at fighting you. And right. custodes are already better. And custodes are right. already better. Yep. Um, so. Something, if you're thinking about doing a Custodes army that is kind of unique, is that you don't need that many models. They're yeah. so good that you might show up with, like, you're like, let's play a 3,000 point game. And you might show up with maybe 40 models. Right. Yep. Because the points but are, are higher and you, have, you get less of them. They're yeah. units of three instead of units in five and ten. We've talked about that in the past um, where like Marines are ten points a model, a tank might yep. be 150 points. I think custodes start around 30 to 40 points a model. At, at the range. minimum, yep. yes. So um, they're really cool looking. They're gold. They, you can literally just rattle can gold if you need to and call it good. Uh, and they look great. Right. You don't need that many of them. And they're amazing at what they do. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, I think they're definitely more of an assault army strength-wise than they are a shooting army. But the shooting that they do have is actually pretty awesome, too. Yeah. And all of their stuff's unique looking. They don't pull from the regular uh, Stardes or the military. They have yeah, all of their own, own unique own flavor looking yeah. um, weapons and things. Very so, cool army. Anything else about the Custodes that I missed? What, uh, one of the interesting things I've always found about the Custodes is that during the Crusades, which was that era before the Horus Heresy where the Emperor was going out and conquering uh, the stars and finding all the lost yep. colonies and finding the Primarchs and whatnot, destroying all the alien races, the Custodes stayed at home. And it wasn't until the Crusade that he realized he needed to put some of his own most trusted agents out in different areas. So the Custodes finally started going out. And uh, you would, the other thing is you'd mentioned that they'd been around for a long time. This is heady and deep. But the Thunder Warriors were the soldiers yep. before the Space Marines, and they were meant just to, they were, they're gone. They got wiped out. They got wiped out because of the Custodes. Oh, the custodes okay. I went, didn't know that. The Custodes went wiped out all of the Thunder Warriors. And when the Thunder Warriors were all dead, that's when he started the Space Marine Project. So when the so, Emperor was done with them. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Their use, so, was, their use was over. Was the Emperor a bad guy? Well, I mean, you know my opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this, too. Whereas Space Marine Legions gets Primarchs, the Custodes get a guy named Constantine Valdor. And his rules says Primarch. His rules say Primarch. And man. King in yellow. He is. He's really cool. Got some 40K cool. stuff there for King yeah. in yellow. We'll, we'll just leave it at he's, he's very, very good. Yeah, check him out for sure. Mm -hmm. So. I think that takes us to Bob's first. That would be me. And what I'm going to talk about is also comes out of uh, Libra Imperium. And it is uh, the f one of the only forces that are, it's actually not an army. So this is assassins. So assassins, uh, they can be loyalist only. They cannot be traitor. And... This little blurb I took from shamelessly from Wiki, uh, when the Emperor spoke, uh, this was during the Great Crusade, when the Emperor spoke this famous declaration during the early years of the Great Crusade, a number of his most loyal servants met, eager to help enact his dreams of united mankind across the settled worlds of the galaxy. These men and women were highly skilled in the craft of stealth, subterfuge, and highly accomplished in the arts of death. They hunted down those who would bring ruination to the emperor's plan and uh, plan for the human betterment. So these were operatives during the, uh, the Great Crusade that were working behind the emperor's back. They didn't even know they were, they were doing it. And when they finally realized that the, what they had learned and the skills that they were using could be lost if they died, they finally went to the emperor and said, kind of been doing this thing 
<laughs> where we've been going to oh, this planet God. that is not falling into uh, it's not uh, falling into the imperial rule, and we killed the, the leader, and then we were able to do that. Now, that's why that planet fell so quick. So they start they go to him, and he realized, yeah, you're right. This is it's terrible, but it's valuable, and we should probably do this. So he formed the assassin um, schools essentially on Terra on Earth, and they formed six different. Uh, Schools, which, by the way, I couldn't figure this one out. They filled four, it all talks about the six schools, but there's actually seven assassins available in this book. So I'm not sure where the other one's coming from. Hmm. Um, maybe if you guys know, you could chime in and let us know. Um, so after they were formed, uh, they, then they started training assassins, but each assassin household has a very different use yeah. uh, method, method of, of their, their, their skill, I guess you could their say. Their purpose, almost. Right, yeah. Um, so it's how you take an assassin in a loyalist army is it has to be an HQ choice and it always is considered a distrusted ally. We talked about that chart where you can cross-reference if we're going to, we'll get into allies uh, at the end, but um, you have different levels of allies that you can either be best buddies or you can all the way down to uh, terrible, terrible allies, <laughs> basically Hated people you don't enemies. want to enemies, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and these guys fall towards the bottom end of that chart where you can't, they can't do much for you other than their specific purpose. Um, the, I'm going to just go over, kind of quick over the different houses. Uh, there's the Vindicare Assassin. Vindicare Assassin is most people's favorite. He's just a sniper. He is going to, you put him up on the table. He has a special rule called infiltration where after your army's deployed, you get to put him up somewhere. And he's very hard to target. And he will knock out the leader of every squad every turn. Nope. As Alpha Legion, I'll never take that guy. Yeah. <laughs> or will you? <laughs> uh, so yeah, he's, 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 and all of these, the, all the different assassins have rules that kind of cover all of them that help them to be more durable, help them to be harder to be targeted, and then each different assassin has its abilities and its entry in the book. So again, the Vindicare, he's a sniper. Uh, the Calexis assassin, this one's pretty interesting. He has uh, what they call the pariah gene in, in the Warhammer uh, Horse Heresy 40k lore. And the pariah gene is basically makes him a null. Uh, we're right. we're going to talk about uh, the warp a handful of times in this, this episode or these, these next two episodes. But the warp is the alternate dimension that every living being has a kind of a spark in that other dimension. Uh, psychers, people who can, uh, who can tap into the warp and use psychic abilities, they're like a blazing beacon in the warp. These guys are literally a dark void in the warp. They're like a black spot in the warp. So can't even be touched by it. Can't even be touched by the warp. So these, well, their abilities in the game are all focused on taking away your opponent's psychic abilities and killing anything with the psychic keyword or any psychers that you have in your opponent's army. Taking away your opponent's fun. Taking away some of your opponent's fun. That's right. <laughs> Just so check. that's their whole thing is, is they're, they're a great uh, HQ choice if you know you're going to be facing a lot of psychers or if you're in an event, you might possibly run into psychers. Uh, this guy is all about knocking down psychic abilities. Next one is the Calidus Assassin. Honestly, probably one of my favorite assassins. Uh, the Calidus Assassin is a straight-up chameleon. Um, okay. This is my favorite. Yeah, this is, this yep. is the one that in different editions of Warhammer 40k, you could take the Caldus Assassin and you could actually say it's one of, in one of your yep. opponent's units. Yeah. And then when what? you choose to reveal it, it just pops out and shoots and attacks. Yeah, it's... it's it still has kind of the same thing. It, yeah, it does. You could just does put it right by your opponent. Yeah, it? it's... it's you could, you could literally just put this model on the table and let it go ham immediately. Like, it just, it's been sitting here the whole time. You're like, Bleh, right? So, the... Dave! <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> So the concept of that is this 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 assassin's gonna sneak into a place that's heavily guarded and try to assassinate the character that they're going after. Um, Eversore Assassin. This is Weapon X from the Marvel Universe on steroids. This thing <laughs> is when they create these assassins, they put them in stasis and then they literally drop them in a pod onto the site that they need to be at as close as possible to the target. The pod explodes, this thing wakes up and starts killing everything in its sight and going straight towards it. It's imprinted on what the target is, so it just murders until it gets to the target and kills the target. So this is, if the if the other ones we're talking about are more precision, this thing's the wrecking ball. This is the broadsword. 
And it's even, uh, when it's sent in, it's meant to die. So when you destroy it in gameplay, it actually explodes and does significant damage to everything point. around gotcha. it, right? Okay. So, right, it's this, this, is, this is the Wrecking Ball. And now, uh, the three I'm not as familiar with because they're, they're unique to Horus Heresy only, yeah. the, the Atomus. Um, Atomus, it kind of felt like when I was reading about it that it's, it kind of ties a little bit into uh, uh, Earth Asian culture, like they're Blade Masters. Okay. Um, and they, they are all focused about the close combat, getting to know their opponent, their opponent's fighting skills, and then beating them in close combat. And they're all about this single strike that just kills immediately. So you guys know, without getting too heady, they have a two plus murderous strike. What? Right, but it's a single attack. Okay. Right. So they're, they're literally one. just when they get in and they just go pow with a precision strike, two plus murderous strike. Well, I mean, you miss on ones, so. Right. Um, it's possible. The venom is the next uh, assassin household. The venom, they're poison masters. Uh, it's right in the name. They're all about uh, so all their abilities are uh, in the in the in the fluff about them. They are the ones that are going to make a specific poison for a specific target, get it to that person, have them take it, and there will no one will ever find a trace of that, or in a lot of cases, not even a trace of the person because they'll dissolve into nothing. Right. Sorry, I just Emperor's New Groove. <laughs> the poison for Cusco. Cusco's right. poison. Don't, don't, mind Steven. Steven. <laughs> <laughs> don't mind Stephen. Don't mind Stephen. And then the last one is, I'm certain that my friend Stephen here's eyebrows are going to peak a little bit, is the Vanis uh, assassin household, which is completely about coercion and manipulation. Their whole point is to actually, in, in the fluff, is to find ways to have somebody else kill their target it's and make it look normal. They can actually have... Your opponent react with their shooting, right? Like, yeah, well, yep. you'll dive into that. Yeah. Rule, <laughs> rule, I've already looked into right. <laughs> 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 Rules wise, they, yeah. they have ways to manipulate your opponent's army. Super cool, cool. right? It is yeah. that's a pretty neat one. So right. I, I just thought the household in general was kind of a cool concept of this. I'm not actually the assassin. I'm going to learn everything I need to learn to make somebody else do my work a for me. Angle. Right, yeah, exactly. yeah, a whole different angle. That's that awesome. may or be, may not be my D and D characters. You're right. <laughs> I thought you might like that one. So that's the that's the seven uh, available assassins uh, that a player can take and add it as an HQ choice. It does take one of one of your three HQ choices uh, when you're building your army. So this isn't an allied detachment. This just takes just the place of plot one, of your one right into your list. Right, and yeah. it, it is loyalist only. Of course, because I would sure love to put a Calidus or a Calexus, no, Eversor assassin in my world leaders. That'd be a lot of fun. Um, but uh, actually, speaking of, there is actually uh, in a PDF they did come out with a Chaos assassin of sorts, and it's a tank that runs at you. I haven't looked into it all that much, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, so they did give traders one assassin, and I know he like changes and mutates as he's attacking and whatnot. But you should be happy with your one. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right, that wraps up. Unless you guys got something else for assassins. No, I think you no. covered it. They're, they're pretty cool. Assassins are sweet. Really flexible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's interesting, too, is the thing to keep in mind about them is they are humans. So they don't, they're not as tough as space marines. And they're not as durable as space marines. They're harder to target than space marines or as a character. Right, right. Um, but if you get a hold of them. They're glass hammers. They're glass hammers. Yeah, yeah for, for sure. sure. Awesome. So that'll take us to our next army uh, coming out again. From Mechanicum. And this is a unique one called the Questorus Knight Households. It's actually, when I was reading this book, um, I read multiple times, but kind of doing the research for this episode, I kind of gravitate toward the Knight Households. Mm -hmm. um, now just think of them as the large robot walkers that are piloted by actual humans. Um, they were what we think of as mechs, or like something like Gundam. Uh, visually, they're about 30, 40 feet tall. Bipedal. Yeah, so you're talking on the tabletop. These models yeah, are. Yeah, they're big guys. Big, right? They got big giant gun arms or close combat arms, kind of stomping across the battlefield. What's really cool about them, um, is that I think so, especially, is the the households themselves, the noble pilots that drive them. They come from these kind of traditional feudal societies. So I can just even comb through the list. I was looking at this, I'm like, wow, I could kind of come up with my own knight household, your own livery, your own colors. You just kind of have a lot of fun with the background of them. So you have these ancient knightly households that raise noble piles to bond with what, again, there's that machine spirit we've been talking about with the Liberty Mechanicum. Right. 
of these mechs. So you can't just have anybody jump inside and start piling these things. It's actually kind of this bond. And again, kind of back to the customs, these nobles are kind of raised to be these pilots of nobility. Kind of a cool fluff background. It's also pretty cool, I thought about them, is they actually predate, uh, maybe, maybe they don't predate the emperor, but they predate the heresy and everything that's going, going on. They were originally designed as actually the defenders of the first settlers, kind of going out and exploring the stars. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, so they were kind of made to, I mean, they actually those thousands of years before the emperor. And I've, um, so what you do is you find these uh, households serving both the emperor on Terra, and they also loyal ones to the Mechanicum. So they're actually ones that follow the Mechanicum, not the Emperor themselves. And of course, Horus, Horus, Horus with his slick tongue. Horus? He convinced a bunch of nine houses to follow him as well. So you can play them loyalist or traitor. Now, they're really interesting because they do have the full army list, but you can also take them, I mentioned it before, is that kind of uh, slot called the Lord of War. So we have all these giant tanks, giant models, uh, big knights, and you can actually drop them into a uh, Mechanicum list, uh, an Astartes list, as a mm -hmm. Lord of War choice. Um, traitor or Loyalist. Traitor or Loyalist. So if you want to have a Space Marine army and just a big knight top in the middle, go for it. But if you also want to actually play a pure knight army, uh, you certainly can. Uh, the big knights have a, actually some smaller knights called Armagers. A little bit smaller, a little bit faster. They kind of play the role as troops. They're like dreadnoughts. A little bit bigger, yeah. but yeah, they're like so dreadnoughts. So if you have a knight, yeah. you've got an armager. I wish you had props. You know, you would I think. I props. Maybe you'd be like, this is a knight. Uh, you <laughs> mentioned earlier when you wanted to kind of build and play Custos, you only had to bring 20, 30 models. Right. What if I sold you on six models for an entire army? <laughs> <laughs> because you can do it with Christoris Knight Households. Right. Yeah, it's, it's actually pretty cool in the rules. They let you take one knight, and there's at least five or six different options. Mm -hmm. And, and for, some, some of them are big. There are some knights in that that are massive, massive, brutal firepower machines, right? Not only firepower, but when they blow up, they kill everything. Right. <laughs> this area of effect. When I think any it. knight. Right. Yeah, I think my salamanders have died more to knights blowing up next to them. Right. <laughs> I've lost so many of them. But anyways, all you have to do is you can take one knight, you can take two armagers per knight, and you can kind of build an army list from there. It's pretty simple. Um, they're really fun to build. Big models. Again, easy to paint. Um, a bunch of cool banners, a bunch of co uh, cool options. Yeah, make your own household. Make a custom, ho uh, custom household if you use one of the ones that they suggest. I know that we have been, Jay and I have been talking about it. Uh, I have my family... Crest? Yeah, family crest. Yeah. Oh, no, and sure. do a whole knight household yeah, based on your own colors. family crest with the colors yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. all these, they, they have these giant, basically, banners that hang yep. below, mm -hmm. like between their legs, essentially. Uh, and that's where, like, their heraldry and symbols. What crusades they've been in, what battles they've played, what, <coughs> what major other lords of Kind of like the so. legions, the households themselves kind of have infighting and rivalries. Yeah. And it's kind of their whole. Uh, own narrative going on at the same time. And, the, yeah. and kind of rules-wise, the thing I really think is cool about them is they're kind of half vehicle, half dreadnought. Mm -hmm. So they can they can move and shoot and assault, but they kind of, they take damage with armor value and they have void like shields. Vehicle, right? Yeah, just a bunch of cool stuff going on. A bunch of words you probably don't understand at this point, but yeah, but we'll get there in deep dives. Right. Um, their combat, no, no rights of wars, it's pretty simple. You put the big, big mechs down, you shoot, you move forward, and you prompt, you prompt stuff on right. your feet. It's pretty straightforward, really easy to pick up army, uh, really, if you want to build low models, easy to paint, mm -hmm. easy to learn, because you got one set of rules you got to follow. It's a really good beginner armor, I would say. Yeah, it's. I would think it's, I, I personally think it's as far as a beginner to get into for sure, but having such a low model count army sometimes is a little harder to play on the table, because you have, if you have different objectives, you got to get to it. That's fair. You have to do. That's fair. But, yep. uh, it's they're cool no matter what. They are. Yeah, they're fairly popular. And again, you can also combine it with your space marines. So you can always pick up the models slowly. Right. And maybe have kind of two armies going. Yeah, I mean, there's there. It's such a huge temptation for a model or painter. I, that's I, that's one of my favorite things about knights in general is that you can have an army of knights. You can actually have an allied detachment of knights. So a little smaller yeah. army of knights that attach to your primary army, or you can run just a single knight as your lord of war choice in whatever army. You're yeah. Running. Yeah. That's that's pretty neat. Just good models to Pretty have. Pretty neat. To find a use for them, for sure. Absolutely. 
Yeah. So I think that about wraps it up for this episode. Do you guys have anything else on the night you want to talk about? No. I love blowing them up and my world leaders, they assault them, they blow them up, and then half but, of them then die. Then all of your stuff dies. All of them, yeah. Some of them. Yeah, all of them die. <laughs> all right, well, that wraps it up, guys. Thanks for joining. Um, if you like our content and you want to see more, make sure to like, comment, follow, and subscribe to whatever format you're watching this or listening to this on. Um, and if you want to uh, help support us more, we have a link in our Patreon, uh, in the down, and our link down below is our Patreon, and you can help us out there as well. So, What's coming up next? will be the rest of the non-Space uh, Marine Legion uh, forces. That's the next one we'll do. And then the final one after that will be talking about how to build an army list, how you use allies, how you use Lords of War, right. uh, the different things, how to actually build an army. And I think we can finally cut loose on some of the fun stuff we want to try. Excited for the deep dive. And if we got anything wrong, please mention in the comments. Yeah, pick comments. I know we didn't, but you can comment if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mike.